Hello and welcome to Ancient Words Speak Today. I'm Pastor Nathan Kraus and I invite you to join me as together we look into the pages of Scripture to discover how the Bible is still relevant to our lives and how these ancient words really do speak today. Well, Happy New Year. Uh, I don't know how many of you might have gotten this email from one of our church members. Uh, you may have heard me tell a similar story in the past, and then I saw it in email form, and I know a few of you were on that same list when I got it. Um, it was a story of an old Amish farmer who had never been to the mall before, and his grandchildren had convinced him, Grandpa, we really ought to go to the mall and check this out sometime. You know, you're an old man, you've never even been off the farm. Go in to see this. So they drove an hour and a half to the closest mall. They took him to see it. He sat there and, and they, he walked around a little bit and then he sat on the bench because he'd had enough of it. They said, what do you think so far, Grandpa? He said, I've never seen so many things I didn't need in my entire life. <laughs> and then they wanted to continue enjoying the mall experience, so he sat on one of those comfortable benches and just watched people. I love to people watch when I go to the mall and he was doing that. And while he was watching people, he noticed an old woman bent over with a cane go up to a shiny wall with some buttons next to the, the, end, the part of the wall. And so she pushed one of those buttons and the wall opened up to his surprise. He was just amazed at this. And then she kind of stumbled her way in with her cane, walked into that opening in the wall, and the wall closed. She disappeared in the wall. Now this fascinated him, so he watched a little longer. Well, it wasn't too long. After about a minute, the wall opened up again, and out came this young, beautiful woman. And he called to his grandson, Billy, go get your grandma, quick! <laughs> Wouldn't you love it if we could just magically and quickly change ourselves like that? But change doesn't happen so easily and so rapidly. And it's not just a matter of exterior change, is it? God says everything can be new for us. But that newness comes from the inside out. It's not magic. No magic buttons, no magic walls. There is no magic formula. But there is a miraculous process. When Christ lives in us, everything becomes new. Paul understood this very well because you know what he experienced. He became a new person. And in his testimony, he shared it several times throughout the book of Acts. But we're going to look at 2 Corinthians today as he wrote to the Corinthian believers. We're going to take a, a look beginning there in chapter 5. And I'd like to start around verse 12 there. Paul had a situation in Corinth where there was a schism developing. There were several schisms people were following one or another of the leaders that had arisen. And many of them apparently were saying that Paul was really not to be respected. He wasn't so great after all. And they were questioning his credentials as a teacher. Well, Paul addressed this. Beginning at verse 12, we listen into the conversation as he's writing to them. For we do not commend ourselves again to you, but give you opportunity to glory on our behalf, that you may have something to answer those who glory in appearance and not in heart. You see, there were people who looked on the outward appearance, and when they looked at Paul, they weren't that impressed. And that was one of the things they criticized him for. According to what we know from historians, Paul apparently was a short man. He was bow-legged and he was bald, and from his own admission in his letters, he says, I'm not a great speaker. And yet, we read his letters and we realize this man who wrote more than half of the books of the New Testament, 
is an incredible theologian, a great teacher. But he wasn't that impressive to look at, and apparently in his understanding, he wasn't even that impressive to listen to. And many other people apparently came along with a flashy new way of presenting the gospel, and they began to undermine the work of Paul. And Paul's saying, look, we don't look on the outside. That's not what it's about. Continue in verse 13. For if we are beside ourselves, that probably was an accusation against him too. Later we know that when he was testifying before Festus and Agrippa, we'll come to that part in the book of Acts later, that he uh, also was called crazy. You know, you're beside yourself, Paul. So this is not a, an accusation that only came to him once. If we are beside ourselves, it is for God. Or if we are of sound mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ constrains us, because we judge thus that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all, that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Paul's saying if Christ died for everyone, then it's as if everyone died. And we live now for Christ who died and rose again. Going on in verse 16, he says, Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. In other words, even though we looked at him as a common man before, we, get, we judged him by his outward appearance. From everything we could see outwardly, he was nothing special. He was no one to pay attention to. He was just another one of these preachers who'd come along and said, you know, look at me. And he garnered a following, that's true. But Paul did not believe he was the Messiah. But he says, now we don't look at him outwardly. Though he may not have met our outward expectations, we look at the fruit and we know who he was. Verse 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, knowing who Christ was, now he says, understanding that he is the Messiah that God had sent. If anyone is in Christ, he or she is a new creation. God makes us new when we're in Christ. New from the inside out. If anyone is in Christ, he or she is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, my Bible says all things have become new. The oldest manuscripts don't have that all things. As a matter of fact, the new ones have it placed in one of two. They're not, it's not always in the same place. It may have been added later because in the next verse, Paul says, now all things are of God. So they, this idea that everything's new is still there. But things become new. Now, is everything new? If somebody's in Christ, it's not the stuff that changes around us. It's not the circumstances. It's not our world. But it's we. It's us who change. When we change, everything else is new because we have changed. We have a new perspective on the world. We look at life differently. The things I used to hate, I love. The things I used to love, I hate. Are you with me on that? Some of you understand what I'm talking about, right? God changes. This miracle happens within us. We don't walk into the shiny doors and come out different one day. But God starts changing us from the inside out, and we realize that everything is new. Why? Because I am new in Christ, and now I have a new way to relate to everything in life. So here we are in 2013, a new year. And God gives you a new slate, a new opportunity, a new canvas, empty. The old things are forgotten. You can write your story this year as you see fit. And everything is new. You are a new creation and everything is new and that word new is kainos in Greek. It's not neos. There are two words for new in Greek. Neos means new like fresh, like today's newspaper is new. It wasn't yesterday's newspaper, it's new. But it's still a newspaper. We're familiar with them. It's nothing different. It's the same old Washington Examiner or whatever newspaper you happen to read. But it's new in that it's the most recent edition. It's fresh. That's neos. 
Paul doesn't use that word here. He says if you're in Christ, you are new in a different way. You are kainos. New meaning different in form or type. Different from whatever you were before. I have something new here in my pocket. A couple of new things I want to share with you. This is my new license. On December 28, my license expired. And so for my birthday, I celebrated by going to the MVA. That's a great place to hang out on your birthday. Because I waited until the last minute to do it. I got to go and get my photo taken. And I have a new license. But you know what? It's not new in the sense that it's not kynos. It's naos. It's the same old face on there, four years older. But I think I'm looking younger all the time. <laughs> thanks to my wife's good care. Uh, it's the same... Address, same name, same ugly Maryland crab on there. I don't know who decided to, you know, I guess people who enjoy eating crabs put that on there. I'd rather see a, a great blue heron or something else. But uh, there we have the same map of Maryland, the same class C, the same little red heart indicating that I am an organ donor. It's the same, the same chip strip in there to prevent counterfeit. The back looks the same. So I guess it's naos, not kynos. It's only updated. But God wants to do something more with you than update you. He wants, when you come to Christ, he's not just updating software. He's not giving you more information so that you can think about new things only. He's completely overhauling and reinstalling your operating system. He's making you completely new from the inside out. So now you are kynos, not naos. I do have something which is kynos here. These are my old insurance cards. One for prescriptions, one for dental and vision and alternative therapies. You see, they're, they're basically the same. And that was my insurance cards. But this past week or week and a half ago, I got something new in the mail. Because now I have a new, new insurance cards, and they look different. And of course, my coverage isn't as good as it used to be either. With all the changes going on, that may be no surprise. But look, you see the difference? It's not just updated. It's not na naos. It's kynos. It's a different provider, different kind of coverage, different benefits. It's not the same as this, which was simply, I couldn't show you my old one, but it looked the same as this. They made me turn that in. Are you beginning to understand the difference between naos and kainos? When God says, you are kainos in Christ, and the whole world around you, everything becomes kainos when you are in Christ, he means everything changes, not just updated. Everything is brand new in a different sort of way. Now, I know many of us can say, I've had that experience. Most of us probably can say, I had that transformation process occur years ago, perhaps, when I gave my life to Jesus for the very first time. And yet, being in Christ is a continual experience that we renew by our choices, moment by moment, day by day, year by year. And so, if you are willing, this year, and this day, and at this moment, to say, Jesus I want to be new in you again. I don't want to just be updated with new information. I want you to continue that renewal process from within. Make me new on the inside so that I'm different, so that I become more like you, so that I reflect your character to the world around me. And I know that I'll see the world in a completely different way. Lord, there are still some things perhaps that I have a love for, some cherished sins in my life, some things that perhaps I'm clinging to. Help me to hate that which I'm currently loving and I shouldn't. Lord, help me to love that which I might hate right now, but I should love. Make me new in that way, Father. And so Jesus invites you to come to the table. Come and be new in him by maintaining the connection with him. I'm just going to read a little further so that we can keep things in context. 
Again, they're at verse 18. Now all things are of God. You see, when you, you're new in Christ, you see everything from a perspective, everything from God's perspective. Who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. God in Christ reconciled, brought things together, fixed things up, repaired the relationship in Christ. And now, he says, through us, he calls you to be an ambassador for him. You go and take that message of reconciliation to the world around you. Verse 20, therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. Corinth was an important city politically. And actually, one, one of the things that a person could possibly attain to in Corinth, if you were to reach the upper echelon of society, you could be an ambassador, because there were several ambassadors residing in Corinth who were government representatives. And so Paul seizes on this opportunity to take something they're aware of and uses it as an illustration of how God wants us to represent him in the world around us. And for most of those in Corinth, they could never get up to that half a percent of the population that could say, I'm an ambassador. It just wasn't going to happen for most of the people. But he says to them, you can be an ambassador for Jesus Christ. When you are in Christ, he now calls you to be his ambassador and take that message of, of reconciliation because you represent him. An ambassador represents with full authority. Therefore we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Now, how earnestly did Christ reach out to win souls? I mean, it was his passion. I don't think anyone prayed like Christ ever or spoke like Christ. We have the record from the Gospels. Never did man speak like this. The record that goes, the report that goes back when the spies were sent out to him. We never heard anybody who spoke like this before. And why? Because he had that deep burden for souls. And now if we're called to be his representatives, how should we live? What should we value more than anything else on the planet? The souls for whom Jesus shed his blood. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That's the transaction. That's the heavenly transaction that takes place when we allow Christ to dwell in us and we reside in him. Now, to represent that connection, you know what Jesus did. He changed up the Passover meal. He was celebrating the Passover with his disciples in the upper room, and that Lord's Supper, as we've come to call it, had something new in a kinos sense, we could say. In a different way, he, he made it new. It wasn't just a new Passover meal because it was that year's new Passover meal. It was new in the sense that he changed it. He made it to represent something different. The Passover was pointing forward to him and his death, and now he says, I'm here, I've arrived, and this bread represents my broken body. This, blo this juice represents my spilled blood. I'm going to give my body and shed my blood for the life of the world. Do this in remembrance of me. So today, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, no matter what your faith background, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are invited to come to the table and enjoy that close connection that he has symbolically given us. Because as you partake of these symbols of his body and blood, you're expressing your commitment to that connection with him. So... In a moment, we will separate before we partake of it. We'll do what Jesus and his di disciples did. He washed their feet. We will have an opportunity to wash another's feet and to have our feet washed 
um, so that we can understand that we come to Christ and he makes us servants. We have a humble servant attitude. Washing feet was, was a servant's job. And so when we participate in the foot washing, we're reminded Jesus calls us to serve. And when our feet are washed, we're reminded that Jesus says, I can clean you up. When Peter didn't want it at first, and then he said, Lord, if the case is that Jesus said, you have nothing to do with me if you don't have your feet washed, he said, then wash me everywhere, head to toe. Jesus says, that's not necessary. You only need your feet washed if you've had a bath. So if you've had your bath, you've been washed in Christ, you've had your baptism, today Jesus offers you a little washing of your feet. Because if you've had a bath and you walk through the dusty streets of this world, you know that your feet can get dirty. We, we're not cleansed completely from sin. We're not pure. We're not perfect. And Jesus says, let me just wash you and give you that reminder that in me you can be new and clean and fresh. So when your feet are being washed, I want you to think about that. Jesus washes me clean. And when you're washing someone else's feet, I want you to remember that Jesus calls you to be a servant, to be humble, to be willing to serve others.